All right. OK. We're going to keep talking about electric fields today, but I wanted to uh, remind you what we've been doing. Um, and I want to point out that for the electric fields and electrostatics, we're jumping around a lot. So remember I said that this year we're trying to, cr or to fit in more topics, so we're cutting things a little less detail. And a big one we're cutting is electrostatics. OK, so we're going to jump around. The uh, scheduled document that you look at has the exact sections we're going to cover. I got an email that pointed out I needed to update it starting next week, and I will be updating it. This week's is accurate. OK, so just look at the exact sections we're going to cover, and we're going to jump around. So 22, I think, was a lot of last week. So remember, we learned about charge on subatomic particles. Sounds very fancy. It just means electrons, protons, neutrons, and how macroscopic objects can be charged. Remember, everything holds a lot of charge, but if it's neutral, it's just that the charge is canceling. But if you add some extra charge to the surface of a rod, say, you can charge it up. And we talked about insulators, conductors, and how charge can get pushed around in a conductor, which can lead to interesting effects. Um, and we talked about Coulomb's law, of course, for calculating forces and the idea of the electric field. Okay? So this week in 23, I believe is the number, um, we're going to talk more about the electric field, how to get it for point charges, and what it does to charges. And we'll get a little bit today into the idea of the potential. But in chapter 23, we're skipping calculating the field from a continuous object, which requires calculus and integrals. So depressed that we aren't going to do that. But there just isn't time if we want to get to the more exciting stuff. So if you want to do the real field theory, I'm sorry. We're, we're going to kind of gloss over that a little bit. We're also completely skipping Gauss's Law, chapter 24. So we're going to go straight from a little bit of 23 to 25. You're missing all the beauty and all the symmetry. I, I'm sorry. But anyway, so that was just a quick overview. So remember, if you want to know what are we covering, there's a schedule with the exact sections, and then there's always this to remind you of what we're covering. OK? So here we go. We're going to pick up pretty much where we left off last time, except now we're going to talk about the electric field due to uh, multiple point charges. Multiple point charges. Well, you can probably guess that if we, we did the uh, force due to multiple point charges, force is a vector. The electric field, remember, is just the force per unit charge. The electric field is also a vector, so it's really the same thing. Okay? You're just adding vectors. If you have two charges creating two fields, you just add the fields. So to, again, we're not getting as detailed. We're not getting real deep into the unit vector analysis level of this. But it is that we're adding vectors, and you do know how to do that. So let's say we had two charges then. One micro well, let me run them bigger. Draw them bigger. One micro coulomb here, and then one micro coulomb here along the x-axis. And this one is at the origin. And we could go up in y, and we could go down in minus y, and this is minus x, and this sits at the origin. You can just tell, because that's where they cross. Okay, there we go. And they're separated by 10 units on whatever, whatever the x-axis units are. It's separated by 10 of them. Okay, and we'll call them A over here and B over here. So rather than just calculate the, the, the field somewhere, let's ask the fun question, where is E zero? Where are you going to get no electric field due to this configuration? Because often in these problems where you're getting fields due to charges, you often don't just have a simple formula that you plug in and say, I'm going to plug in the formula here. And you can do that, but it's not sort of the typical problem. So more commonly, we'd ask something like this that makes you think a little bit about symmetry and vector sums and the physics of what's going on, those sort of horrible things that we think about. OK, so um, let's see. Must be somewhere E from each charge cancels. What? Yes. OK, so how is the field going to be 0? Well, uh, it must be a, a place where the vectors from these two are going to cancel. Right? Because we know we add them as vectors. So it must be some place where you have the vector one way and the vector the other way, and they give you 0. So we're just trying to figure out where, where is that going to happen. Okay? So we could start, I would start by ruling places out. 
it's not above the x-axis, right? Um, because both make positive EY. If you look at that and convince yourself that's true. It can't be above the x-axis. Anywhere I go above the x-axis, let's go here. This one, which way is its electric field? Remember, what you, the way you get the electric field direction is you think about a test charge that's positive. Imagine a little test charge there, positive. It's going to feel a repulsive force because like charges repel. So there's E due to A. And imagine a little positive test charge here with B there, repulsive force, E due to B. So their lateral components might cancel, but their vertical components are going to add. And that's going to be true if I go here or here or even here. What if I went here? This one is going to be repulsive, E due to A. The one over here, farther away, but also repulsive, E due to B. The horizontal components and the vertical components will add, but you'll definitely get a field pointing up. There's no way you're going to go above the x-axis and have the y components of the field cancel. Because you're on this side of positive charges, the field will always push that way. So you have to, this is the kind of stuff you do when you think about fields. You've got to think about which way is it going to point in all directions. Remember, for a point charge, if it's positive charge, it points away in all directions. So above the x-axis, this one's pointing away. Above the y-axis, uh, above this charge, this one's pointing away above the x-axis. By the same argument, you could say it's not below the x-axis because both make minus ey. Right? Can't possibly be zero down there because if I go right here and say which way is the electric field there? E A is that way. Which way is E B? E B is that way. How am I getting those directions? Remember, it's between two points is always how you define it. If there were a test charge here, you would draw a dashed line between the two charges, and the force would be along that line. That's how I'm picking those directions. Therefore, the field is also along that line. So here, the net field would not be zero because the Y components can't cancel, and anywhere else you go, it's not going to be zero. Right? Here, that one would be like that and like that. Not going to be zero. So you've got to look at it and think, where could it be zero? Um, where else could it not be zero? Not to the left of both charges. All right, what if we go over here? The field due to that one is going to be this way. The field due to that one is going to be weaker, but it's also going to be that way. So that doesn't work. Right? No way those are going to cancel. Not to the right of both charges. Why not? What about right there? The field due to that one, that way. What's the field due to this one? That way. Not going to cancel there either. So the only place in the entire universe that we have left is on the x-axis between the two charges. On x-axis between two charges, there might be a place where the field is zero. I'm not even promising you that there will be. There might be. Now why did I have to do all that? Why couldn't I just write an equation and set it equal to zero? Wouldn't that have been easier? I can't, because remember, the field is defined as a spherical coordinate, and I've laid this out in Cartesian coordinates. So there's no one Cartesian equation that will describe everywhere in space. You have to go through these little mental exercises to do it. If you really wanted to write one equation to describe the whole thing, you could do the whole thing in spherical coordinates, except one's not going to be at the origin. You don't want to do it, trust me. You'd rather think through these kind of ideas, because it will be what we call, in physics, a mess. Let's see. So let's see if we want to finish the problem. So the first step then was to say, OK, where roughly would it be? And now let's figure out exactly where it would, go, where it would be. And this you could also maybe get just kind of by thinking about it. But let's go through the math anyway, and then I'll show you how it could be more complicated. So let's look at the vector sum of E due to A, the charge A, and E due to B um, on the x-axis between the charges, because we decided that's the one place there might be 
E equals zero somewhere. All right, so we're going to say E A plus E B equals zero. And we're going to do the informal vector stuff because we're doing the informal electrostatics. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a magnitude and make it positive when it's to the right, and I'm going to make it negative when it's to the left. We are going to do I hat and J hat and all that. So what is the magnitude of the E field due to the charge at A at some position along the x-axis? K, electrostatic constant, as they call it here. Uh, the charge, one microcoulomb. All right, and then you write that other charge here, but no, you don't, because we're doing the electric field. Remember, the electric field is the force you would get, which would have the charge there, divided by that charge, so they went away. That was how the field works. You just write the charge that is the source of the electric field. And then you write how far it is squared. So if we're picking some position in here, it's just an x. Right? We're saying some x between 0 and 10. Okay? So we just say x squared. That's the distance between the charge and that point. The E field due to this one, we know it's going to be that way. So I'm going to make it negative, And I'm going to write the electrostatic constant. And I'm going to say here, 1 microcoulomb. Right? I've got to write another charge. No, no, no. It's not a force. It's just a field. And how far away is the point x from charge b? 10 minus x. 10 minus x squared. Right? And those have to be 0. All right, so this is a and this is b. Ah, la, 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 la. So then how much algebra should we do? k times 10 microcoulombs over x squared equals k times 10 microcoulombs over 10 minus x quantity squared. Oh, look at that. Flip it over. Don't get nauseous here. I know I do this algebra so fast you're going to throw up, or you're going to throw up for some reason. <laughs> it may not be the algebra. And now, are you the kind of people that like to take a square root and roll the dice on that negative sign, or do you like to uh, foil things out? On three, say square root or foil things out. One, two, three. Give me a break. We're going to foil things out. When you take a square root, the negative root might screw you over, right? It's plus or minus. Well, let's foil. Oh, man. Oh, 100. This is so much better. Faster than the square root. Look at that. Look how fast that happened. It's actually better. Oh, your young intuition. X equals 5. It's the same thing, right? The square root, you would have got 2x equals 10. Here, I got 20x equals 100. Ooh. We'll both get x equals 5. But you'll have a negative root, and you'll be up at night thinking, what about the negative root? So the answer, does the answer make any sense? Is the field 0 at x equals 5? Yes, of course it is. Because at x equals 5, that's right in between, which is where we would predict the magnitude of the field due to A and the magnitude of the field due to B would be the same. So you actually didn't need to do all this math. You could solve this one by something in physics we call inspection. Okay? Inspection is just a word we use when we say, we don't want to do the math. We can tell by looking at it. Okay? So that one you could kind of do by inspection because I made the two charges the same. If the two charges had had different values, this wouldn't have turned out so nice, right? There'd be like a 2 on here. And then you'd have to do that negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. You'd have to find the roots the old-fashioned way, okay? But because I wanted my lecture to go more quickly, I made the charges the same. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, it was just extra 0. There you go. It's supposed to be 1. Yeah, I saw the 10 on the bottom and just spazzed out. So it is one. Yeah, yeah so there are the charts. So you might do a homework problem where the charges aren't the same, and you actually have to find roots, but it's physically the exact same thing. Or, ooh, what if we did this? What if one of them was negative? Would the point where it's 0 be in the middle? Ah, oh, no, it would be somewhere else. Scary, yes. But that's the basic idea, OK? Let's do a neither one here. Um, yeah, uh, let's do another one here. And just another case of finding the field due to a, uh, yeah, finding the field due to point charges. 
So we're not going to do all the E fields of continuous charges and all the calculus, but we are going to talk about dipoles more. Because dipoles uh, more than we used to. Because they are very fundamental to a lot of chemistry and a lot of biology, so I feel like we'll do more of that. Okay? So let's look at the E field uh, next to a dipole. Okay. So, and to do it, we've already done all the work. Recall as physics for, we've already done this. Let's not do it again. Recall the F, the force, on a charge near a dipole. Right, let's recall that. There has to have been a question at this point. Surely, oh my god, you guys are so smart. Um, recall the force. What did we have? Remember, and remember, you also be thinking, what was a dipole again? So let's remember it was two opposite charges with the same magnitude, right? And they were on an axis. And the special thing is they're kind of like they're attached by like I think of it as a drinking straw, but without the little without that thing in it, just a rigid drinking straw like that, a boba straw. I'm sorry, a boba straw. I used to go to McDonald's and drink, you know, cola, but you drink boba, so. There you go. Um, let's see. Pos minus n is the origins right there. Okay. So sometimes in drawings you'll see this thick line. All that means is remember they're like attached by a rigid stick and they it can't they can't crash into each other. Let's see. And the, what we saw before was the force. We can call that the uh, x-axis. Force somewhere along the x-axis like that. But what we want to solve now is the electric field somewhere along the x-axis, like here. Say at point, often it's referred to as point P. So we want to say, what is E at point P? Like that. So we could start over. We could say, well, each one of these is going to create its own field, and we just got to vector add the fields, like we did over there. So we draw a little line, and we say, this is plus Q. So if I were a positive little test charge, short and stout, I would feel a uh, force this way. So therefore, the field is that way. And here, if I were a little test charge short and stout, I would feel a force attracted to the negative Q. OK? Uh, except they would be equal in magnitude, because they have the same distance. And they have the same Qs, and the little test charge has the same Q. So you would add those up, and you'd get a field like this. Good lord, they're supposed to be in There you go. You get something like that. So this would be E of P. Right. This is the electric field due to the negative charge. This is the electric field due to the positive charge. And then vector sum to something kind of like that. So you just have to do all the work. And then this distance would be d. Sorry, I forgot to label this. This would be d. So they're at plus d over 2 and minus d over 2. But you've already done all the work because we already solved this. We already said that, well, recall f. We already did. Okay. So f uh, of q if we apply the big Q on uh, uh, the force due to Q on, hmm, what did we do? <laughs> F, Q, D, this is not a force. Q, D over squared, what did it do? Let's see. Treat Q as, oh, yeah, oh, we're fine, yeah. Okay. Uh, F on Q, yeah. the force that a big Q charge feels here due to these little plus Qs over here. All right, that's the force we calculated last time would be uh, the electrostatic constant little q, big Q, times d in the top because we have d squared over 4 plus x squared to the 3 halves in the bottom. Right. So it kind of looks like Coulomb's law, k, q, q, but since this is over d cubed, essentially, you got an extra d up there. That was, that's correct. That's what we had. I just switched positive and, or whatever. Okay, so all we got to do then, how are we going to get the, uh, how are we going to get the field due to this dipole? So now here is a mental quiz for yourself. I'll give you 15 seconds to think about it. What are you going to divide that force by to turn it into the field due to that dipole? I'll give you a hint. It's either K, little q, big Q, D, or X, or two or three halves. You're going to divide that expression by one of those things I just said to turn this into the E field of a dipole. So just think about it. See if you're keeping up here. See if any of this makes any sense. How do we get the electric field? It's a force, we're going to charge. But which charge is it? Is 
it big Q? Okay. So let's think about it. What we're going to do is treat big Q as a test charge. That's the charge that you move around and say, what's the field here? What's the field here? What's the field here? What's the field here? We're treating big Q as a test charge because we're getting the field due to little Qs, the dipole little Qs. So therefore, we moved big Q around. Okay? So if we treat it as a test charge, then the electric field at point P, due to this dipole, is basically the force on the test charge divided by the test charge. Remember, that's how the electric field works, is this is the force per unit charge. Why is it 3 halves in the exponent of the denominator? This is something we derived last time. Remember, it had the this squared and then the sine. There was a sine theta that gave us another square root. So that's how we got 3 halves down there. But if you look at the dimensions, it's okay, because this is a dimension squared to the 3 halves is the dimension cubed, and there's a dimension up here. So it's still 1 over x squared. Okay, so it is just this we divide by big Q. So if you were mentally thinking and you came up with big Q, you're right. If you've got little Q, you were mixed up. We switch to the capital and the lowercase. Okay. So the answer is KQD over D squared over 4. And then we're going to put an X squared. And then it's to the 3 halves. There we go like that. And which way is it? We have to think back. Oh, it's down. So we just say down. Since we're not being careful with our vectors, down. All right. Hmm. Does that all make sense? It's perfect sense. Is Q the same thing as P? Oh, I'm sorry. P was supposed to be like the point, the geometric position. P. I'll put a plus here. Q is the charge. Charge Q at point P. Sometimes you, just, you call it point big Q, and that just is confusing. But clearly, this is also confusing. The only other thing we said is, what if you're really far away? Right? And I'll, I'm sorry, I'm, getting, I'm going to cram this in. Sorry about that. If x is much bigger than d, okay, you've got to learn how to make approximations. You've got to look at that thing and say, if x is much bigger than d, then what can we say? Is a test charge always positive? Yes. By convention, a test charge is always positive. Good question. If x is much bigger than d, then imagine if x were 10 and d were 1. What would this be? This would be 100. And what would this be? This would be 0.25. What's the precision required on a canvas homework? 5%. This is much less than 5%. Therefore, it does not exist in the world of getting the answer right. Okay? Whenever you're making approximations, you look where, for a place where something is added. Because usually this makes the place where they're added, it makes one of them irrelevant. And that's the case here. It would be 100.25, which is basically the same as 100. So basically, the, if we say x is much bigger than d, we just ignore that part. And then we say, oh, x squared to the 3 halves is x cubed. And then you could write it like this. The E field at point P, due to the dipole, is KQD over x cubed. Right? And that looks just a little nicer. But that's only if you're far away. If you get close, you've got to use the detailed formula. Okay, there's no approximations in the detailed formula. Okay. So all we've done here is get a little bit of practice at using the electric field of a point charge. That's really all we're doing. It's just we're trying to do it in interesting, relevant cases. One like your homework is going to be. One about dipoles, because we love dipoles. We're obsessing with dipoles. That's all we're doing. Um, and now we're going to get a little more specific about the dipole. We're going to give it a few definitions here. We just keep saying, oh, it's two charges separated by D. Let's be more uh, specific about that. Let's see. And give it a fancy name. It's the dipole moment. Oh. Moment. Which is basically just like the math definition of a dipole. You already know essentially what it is, but we need a way to define it. It's equal to the charge times the separation. That's all it is. We define it as some plus and minus charge Q at some separation D, so you just multiply those to get what we call the dipole moment. What, oh, sorry, what is X in the dipole diagram? Uh, X is how far you are along the X axis. It's like the position of P. So you've made it out to X because we solved it for any position. 
This is for any position, and this is for a long or far away. Yeah. Okay, let's see. So the definition of charge by separation. So we actually write it uh, uh, like this. So here's our dipole again, plus Q. Here's minus Q. And let's go ahead and uh, still put it on a little coordinate system here like that. But we can define a vector S. S is like the D. S is the length of the dipole. Right, it goes from minus Q to plus Q. So if you have that defined, then you can say the dipole moment P is Q times S. Okay, this is, again, we just need sort of a vector definition of the dipole moment for more advanced stuff. We're not going to use it that much in, this, in, this, in 126. Um, this is each charge's Q. These are things that are easy to screw up. Is you don't say this dipole has two Q, so I'm going to put two Q there. Okay, it's the Q, the charge of each pole of the dipole. And also, they do have to be the same. Right? So we're assuming just a uniform, uniform symmetric dipole. And then the S, remember the S vector is from negative to positive. Okay, this is important for later when we're trying to get the torque or something like that. And then we could say, okay, what does the electric field do to a dipole? Well, we kind of did it, but here we'll write it um, uh, more formally then, because this is one that like would be, you know, on, the, on your equation sheet, right? Minus K dipole moment over R cubed. It gets even simpler when we define a dipole moment. So let's think about everything. The K is there because the K is there. QD is just the dipole moment. Here we called it QS, same thing. And X cubed we called R because we don't want to be bound to some, rate, some specific Cartesian coordinate system. We're now we're thinking of this as like a spherical coordinate system and you moved away R. Right? So if this is the position over the axis R, there's a position R on the axis R. The negative sign is there because remember, it pointed down. If you had plus here and minus there, the, di the field due to the dipole moment makes the field going down. And if you think about it, well, because part of the field points that way and part of the field sucks this way and they point down. So that's why there's a negative sign there in our pseudo formal uh, vector notation here. Okay? This is just to the side. This technically, this expression that we would usually use is both far and to the side. We haven't done it along the dipole. We just calculate to the side of the dipole. Ooh, but we could do it along the dipole, but we're not going to. We're just going to tell you the answer. The other thing is if you need to know the field of a dipole up here. Now I'm going to, I'll label it in a minute, along, right? Far and along. It is uh, 2 times k times the dipole moment p over r cubed. All right. So this one is far and along the dipole axis. Okay. Let's think if that sign is correct. Let's think for a second. If I were to move along the dipole axis here, which way would the field be? I'm pretty close to this one. That's going to push the field that way. This one is going to pull the field this way, but which one is bigger? This one, because right? this one may, is closer. So its force and therefore its field is bigger than this one, which is far away. Its force and its field is smaller. So the net effect is that the field is up. And sure enough, this says the dipole's field will be the same direction, both positive, as the dipole moment. So that, that's just, you know, we didn't do all those in perfect detail, but that's just I want you to have those ideas in your head. So what's interesting is the E field of a point charge decays as 1 over R squared. We didn't really write it down anywhere, but it goes down as 1 over R squared as you go farther away. The E field due to a dipole goes down as 1 over R cubed. And the reason is a dipole has two charges, and they kind of mask each other's effect. You know, you get far enough away, they look neutral. So that's why the field drops off faster, is they, they're too close together, and they look kind of neutral. But they're not exactly neutral. What if you let D go to zero? D goes to zero, or the separation goes to zero, P goes to zero. P goes to zero, the field goes to zero. Because now it's essentially a neutral nothing. Right. A dipole where you put them on top of each other is nothing. They cancel each other out. Could you explain the arrow at the end of the x-axis? Oh, this was just the direction of the field, the field here, so E. I was explaining why this negative sign is here. Right? When we did this for the here, we said it points down. I was just redrawing that. It points down. 
That's why the general formula has a negative sign in it. It's because this downward field is the opposite direction of how we defined the dipole moment being from minus to plus. So just re-emphasizing that. All right. Now, there is one more field we want to think about here. So we've thought a lot. We spent, you know, this whole half of a lecture thinking about the field due to a point charge. It's just this thing, kq over r squared, and we use it to calculate the field of a dipole and to solve a homework problem. Now we're going to think of a second field. You're, really, you're basically responsible for two fields, is all. The second one is called the uniform electric field. Okay, much less complicated um, than the one of a point charge, which is different in all directions. So basically, you could say it is constant uh, magnitude and constant direction. What more could you ask for? So it looks like this. If I were going to draw it in space to say we have some Cartesian coordinate system, uh-oh, x, oh, no, oh, you'll never know, z, OK. <laughs> no one will notice. Um, what we're going to do then is say it's just everywhere you go, it's the same field to the right. I mean, it doesn't have to be to the right. But this one I'm drawing to the right. So that's a uniform field just constant in the x direction, everywhere you go. If I had to write it in some sort of notation, I would say that the E field, everywhere you go, is just a constant vector along the x direction. I ha that I hat just means in the x direction. OK. Interesting. That's it. That one was a lot easier than the point charge, wasn't it? We'll talk about where it comes from in a minute. But right now, let's think about what forces would a charge feel if it were placed in this field. Right. So before we thought about, wait a minute, the charge made the field based on the force. So now we aren't thinking about what's making this field. I am just telling you, dogmatically, there is a uniform field. Okay? What is the force on a charge in this field? We go back to the definition of the field. The field was the force per unit charge. So you just put the charge on the other side of the equation. And it's also true that the force this Q feels anywhere is that in this sort of constant field, right? So in this case, we'd call it E naught, the uniform field. That's it. So if a charge is sitting here, Q, it's not the one making this field. You say, who made this field? It doesn't matter. It's just a uniform field. Don't worry about it. It was made over in that building. We don't care. We just have, we know it exists. So what do we feel? F equals QE. If the field is this way and the charge is positive, It'll feel a force that way. And that's it. OK? So it's a constant force, same direction. So that seems kind of familiar, right? What, other, what else do you have that's a constant force no matter where you go in the same direction? Gravity. It's like gravity, but we can turn it in different directions. If I were to uh, throw this charge into this uniform field, it would suddenly feel this and move like a trajectory. Because right, suddenly it would continue its velocity this way, if we go back to 125 for a minute. It would keep a constant vertical velocity, but here it would start accelerating in the x. So we can do problems like that. So we're not going to do a bunch because it's really just like 125, which is a prereq. Hey, I don't have to do it. It's a prereq. What about, since we're obsessed with dipoles, the force on a dipole? Hmm, the force on a dipole would be, let me draw it here, plus, and here, minus. Okay, F equals QE. You know, they're both vectors. So if we have a positive Q, it's the same direction as E. F positive. What if we have a negative Q, though? The opposite direction. Look at that. It's going to twist it this way. A positive force that way, a negative force this way, but they're the same magnitude. So the net force, the sum of the forces, is zero. There's no force. So that dipole will just sit there. Okay? It won't, it won't glide this way, it won't glide that way. But what will it do? Uh, it'll rotate. Right? This is an extended object. There's a little boba straw holding these two charges like that. The center of mass is therefore here, assuming it's all symmetric. So it will feel a torque. Okay? Force on a dipole is zero, the torque on the dipole. OK, this is not 125, so I'm just going to sort of give you the answer. We'll kind of say it real fast. 
The torque was RF sine theta. Remember, so you took the axis of rotation, you said R, uh, which was sort of the vector from the axis to the chart where the force is applied. So that's D over 2. D over 2 times F, which is QE. So we get 1 half DQE. Right? 1 half DQE, but DQ is P. So we get 1 half P times E. Oh, but there's a sine theta in there. Oh, and there's two of them. So that takes care of the 1 half. You're with me. It's PE sine theta. The dipole moment times the electric field times the sine of theta. Okay. That's the magnitude of the torque. We're not doing the direction of the torque, so I'll just write it like that. Okay. So a, a, a dipole feels no force in a uniform field because they cancel out, but it does feel a torque, and just the moment times the electric field times the sine of theta, where theta is the angle between you know, the axis of the moment and uh, the field. Okay. So if it's at 90 degrees, that's when it's the maximum torque. If it's aligned, it doesn't feel a torque anymore, and it might stop, right? Because their theta is zero, so sine of zero is zero. I want to show you that this is real, okay? Here, here's something, if you're really thinking deeply here. We have violated one of Newton's laws. We have actually violated it, because what happened here? I said, you can put a little, say, an electron. Oh, let's make it a proton. It has mass, it has charge. I put it in a uniform field. And what does it do? It just starts accelerating. It gains momentum. Can you just create momentum? No. Nope. If I drop an object, we said it can gain momentum, but the total is zero because the Earth accelerates towards the object a little bit. You just don't notice because the Earth is much bigger than the object. If we had two Earths crashing into each other, you would notice. But if I drop a ping pong ball, you don't notice the Earth coming up. But the total momentum of the system remains zero when I drop something because both objects move. Here. One object just starts moving. It looks like it creates momentum. So how do we not, what do we do? How do we conserve momentum? The answer is it must actually, there must be also a force on whatever is making this uniform field. And we may not show it to you. We may just say there's uniform field. Assume it's an infinitely heavy thing. Don't worry about it. But if you notice this problem, that's the answer, is it is pushing back. And I can show you with this. This is the electrostatic windmill. Windmill, sorry. I don't know. So see this? This is like just a piece of metal that we hacked out with like a, a pair of scissors. And we put these sharp points, and at sharp points, you get a really strong field. So if we're going to get one of those arc discharge, no, we don't want an arc discharge. If we're going to get a corona discharge, it's going to happen at these sharp tips. And the corona discharge, electrons will just go flying out. So this thing is giving, this is making the field, and it's giving the electrons momentum that way. So there must be a momentum pushback on this thing the other way. So that means it should basically move, right? It should ro rotate back. So all it is, so there's no motors, anything like that. It just sits here like this. And this goes like that. And then I'm going to use the Wimshurst to apply a big potential to it. It's going to make the electrons fly out, and then it should turn. That is what's supposed to happen. Here we go. Look at that. There it goes. Look. There's little electrons flying out. They're picking up momentum. Therefore, there must, we have to conserve momentum. So it's pushing that thing the other way. And I can show you that's really happening with a quick picture before the break here, is I, instead of letting it spin, I held it still late at night in here by myself. I do lots of weird things in here late at night, as you can probably imagine. And uh, we took a real long exposure of it. And there you can see the little uh, corona discharge coming off the end. So that's the electrons flying out and exciting gas molecules. But we have to conserve momentum, so this thing gets pushed push back. Okay? Okay, so we'll take a break and then we'll talk about whatever's next. I got to look at my notes. I can't remember. What's next? Okay. Keep going, keep going. It's too exciting to, to, to not keep going. So that was really it for chapter 20, 20, 23, 22, 23, 4. That was it for 23. All right, so we calculated the field due to multiple point charges. Um, Uniform electric fields, we now understand, that we didn't say much, and how they are created by charged plates, we skip that. We'll get to it. We'll pick it back up. But I want to skip it because I want to get to the next thing. It's not that complicated. And then we want to predict the motions of charges and dipoles. So I'm not doing a lot of kinematics examples here. I mean, you know how to do the kinematics from 125. Just now you have a force. Think about how the charge will move. So we'll do some of those more like in homework. Um, now, the second half of this week is we jump all the way to 25 because we're skipping Gauss's law, and we're going to talk about potential. This is the most common thing in 
electrostatics that you think about every day as voltage, right? But before we say that, well, let's answer these questions. Um, uh, what is P in the torque equation? P was, that was the dipole moment. That was the charge times the separation. And somebody asked something, but it got deleted. Um, these lines I was drawing, you asked if those were related to charge. Technically, they were related to, if you imagine the test charge in the uniform field, they could be the force on the test charge, but they were the electric field vectors. Right? We were just drawing and showing you that the electric field is the same vector everywhere you go. Yes. Can you explain the kinematics? No, because 125 is a prereq. Oh, you'll figure it out on the homework. I can't redo all of 125 while we're in the middle of 126. Prereqs actually exist. And sometimes they even matter. OK, there we go. But here, I'm going to review some 125 as we introduce uh, the electric potential. All right, so this is basically chapter, we're moving into chapter 25. We have to figure out what does it mean, the electric potential? What are voltages? What is a voltage drop? To start it, let's go back to mechanics. Back to 125. Oh, it's a time machine. Oh, it wasn't beer bike great. Or no, I'm sorry. It wasn't a week great. Oh, yeah, it was awesome. Oh, yeah. um, we saw that we can solve, solve problems with force or energy. That was an option we had. Some problems are better with force, and some are better with energy. Like, for example, we have a ramp, right? And we have a mass on the ramp, and the ramp is at some angle theta, and we let the thing slide down, and we want to know how fast it's going, and it's going to be going V. How fast is it going to go at the bottom of the ramp? If you solve it with forces, it's a little complicated. You'd say, well, the force pulling it down the ramp is mg sine theta because mg is down and n is that way, and you get the component that way. Right? You don't get the full mg. You get some component sine theta of mg. So then you say, OK, the acceleration, according to Newton's second law, is g sine theta. OK. And then you say vf squared equals vi squared plus 2ad. Right? And then you say, OK, uh, Vf squared, so I'm going to say that's 0 plus 2. The acceleration is g sine theta. Oh, I've got to know how high it is. I forgot. Uh, height, right? And that's h over sine theta. I'm sorry, this is, uh, yeah, h over sine theta. Because, yeah, d, the distance that goes is h over sine theta. And you get Vf squared is 2gh. So you get Vf is the square root of 2gh. We did that last semester. Very exciting. Remember that? I'm not doing it in detail here. I'm just trying to remind you roughly what happened. Okay. But then you could also do it with energy. This was the advantage of doing it with energy. As we said, the potential lost equals the kinetic gained. Doesn't it make more sense now that you've had a few months away from it. Potential loss, what did we lose here? We lost MGH. MGH. What did we gain? One half MV squared. V is the square root of 2GH. All right. Same answer. Clutch my pearls. All right. Same thing, both methods. Right. That was the advantage of. Um, uh, of energy. Sometimes it makes a problem easier. And you might say, I'm sort of sadistic. I like this way. OK, well, what if the ramp wasn't flat? What if it did this? You're not that sadistic. Right? Keeping up with the force as it does all this would be very hard. But the answer is still just the square root of 2gh. And you know that because of energy. Okay. Sadistic or math? Yeah, sadistic. Yeah. Unless you're like, working with someone else. And then I don't know. Okay. OK, so now let's look at it and sort of compare it to electrostatics, OK? Um, yeah, let's, like, let's compare the situation to a charge moving uh, in an electric field. So let's say we have um, something sliding down like this. Right, so here we have a surface. So this is mechanics. Right, and we have a mass here at position A. And we want to think about it getting to position B. All right? It's going to roll down. Right? It's going to feel a force pulling it down. If it goes from A 
to be, if we think about mechanics, like we just said, it loses potential energy. And it gains kinetic energy. Okay, so now let's look at this, what is effectively the same situation in electrostatics, just to cement this comparison in your head. Right? Elect ooh, I should rename it, it's shorter. In electrostatics, you might have a big charge here, Q. And that charge is making an electric field that points away from the charge in all directions. We haven't drawn a lot of field diagrams because we're not doing Gauss's law, but it would kind of look like that. If you imagine anywhere I put a test charge, it's getting pushed away, right? Away, 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 like that. So what if we pick this axis here and said, okay, let's look along here and say, what if we have the equivalent is A and B, like that. And we put a little test charge there. They're always positive, plus Q, right? What's going to happen if we just let it go? Just like this. If you just let it go, it feels a force pushing it from A to B. This also feels a force. Which way? Uh, opposites, uh, uh, like charges repel. Electric field is that way. F equals QE. All those reasons, it's going to be that way. Okay? So it's going to move from A to B. So we would say, if this charge goes from A to B, we can say the exact same thing. It's clearly going to gain kinetic energy, right? Gains kinetic, right? Just like this one gained kinetic, but it, we have to conserve energy, so there must also be a potential energy there. It's got to be. It can't be something just magically picks up kinetic energy. It also can't magically create momentum. We solve the momentum problem. This thing actually pushes back a little bit, but it's big and heavy. We don't think about it. But we also have to solve the energy problem. How can this just gain kinetic? Ah. It must lose potential. So in the exact same way that the mechanical system loses and gains, the electrostatic system loses and gains. Okay. So that is what we're doing here. How much, you ask? Can we calculate it? Uh, I hate to hide that on you so fast, uh, but we're going to need it. Let's see. Yeah, how much? OK, I'll hide it on you, sorry. Just put this way. You saw all that. You got that down. Oh, no, I didn't erase. So let's see if we can calculate this, the amount of electrostatic potential energy. Let's see. We're still just doing energy. Nothing real wild here. Let's look at the electric potential energy. I just convince you that it has to exist, right? Everybody agrees it has to exist. Anybody feel like there isn't any? It really must be there. We can't just magically gain kinetic. Um, how are we going to find it? Find with a work calculation, just like we did in 125. Let's do it like we did in 125. Do you lift? I do not. OK, so here you have a mass right here. The initial energy is 0. You lift it up to here with you know, your hand, or I would use you know, a machine, and you lift it up a height h, like that. You apply a force to it. Right? If you're going to lift it, you have to overcome its weight. So we imagine you apply exactly its weight, just enough to nudge it and get it going, and you apply mg. So the work you do is you apply mg through a height h, and therefore we say delta u is mgh. Recall that there's no fundamental formula you use to, derive, to, to explain the change of potential energy. You always get it by doing, uh, calculating how much work you do to go from one place to another. There is no fundamental potential energy formula like there is for kinetic energy. Kinetic energy has 1 fmb squared. Potential energy doesn't have that. It's from work. OK, so you lift. Do you even compress? I don't even do that. Okay. So say you've got a mass here and a spring here connected to a heavy thing, and you want to push it, you're going to do work on it. Right? And what was it? Oh, here we had to do an integral. The work is the integral of f dx, because the force is a function of position. 
Oh, no. So it's the integral of 1 half kx squared, or of kx, right? kx dx. 1 half kx squared. And you get that the delta u, we're not really doing it, is 1 half kx squared, delta x squared, however much you compressed it. So there's your delta u for a spring. MGH, 1 half kx squared. Hopefully these sound familiar. You remember these, right? Just reminding you that the place we got potential energy was really from calculating the work. So let's do that now, right? Lift, compress, and now let's push a charge against, oh, should we do a uniform field or the crazy field of a point charge? Uniform field. For now, it'll be much easier to do a uniform field. So I'm going to draw a uniform field like this and just say, you know, there's an E naught, a uniform electric field pointing to the left. Okay? I have a positive charge here. And what I want to do is I want to know the potential energy it has, the change of potential energy if I go from here to here. So really the question is how much work does it take to get from A to B? Just like here, I lifted it over distance H. Here, I pushed it a distance delta X. Here, I'm going to push it a distance uh, D, just to use different letters every time. Work, in every case, was force times distance. Force times distance, integral version, force times distance. So the force, we just have to slightly, we have to barely overcome the electrostatic force, which is QE naught. Right? So uh, QE naught times the distance D. And that's it. Right? That's the work we had to do. So the change of potential energy then would be delta U in a uniform field would be Q E. And if we sort of generalize this to any delta X we go through, it would just be delta X. Okay? So there, that was a specific D, but I could go any delta. I could even go this way. And I would lose, like if I started this the origin and I went this way, this would be negative because I would uh, lose potential energy. If I push against the field, I gain potential energy. So it's just like a ball rolling up and down hill. MGH, QEH, essentially the same thing. Right? Uniform gravitational field down, uniform electrostatic field to the side. That's why this is MG delta Y, and this is QE delta X, up and down sideways. They're really very, very similar, a uniform field and a gravitational field. OK, what have we done here? All we've talked about is energy. We haven't really talked about anything else. We just realized that, oh, we have energy in an electrostatic system. Um, but now what we're going to do is come up with this concept of the potential. Not the potential energy, but the potential. And to do so, we use something called an analogy. How many of you took the SAT? Almost all of you. How many of you remember analogies? Do they still have analogies on the SAT? Yes. Of course they do. You remember analogies, they go like this. Oh, a glove is to hand, a sock is to foot, right? Because you put a glove on your hand and a sock on your foot, right? You remember analogies, here's one. Hafner is as sexy as walk. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's, these need to be updated. That's a very old slide. Let's see, any more? Uh, picture is to blurred as knife is to dull. You remember how this works, right? And then here's one. Will Rice is to beer bike as Libra is to opera. You get the idea of how these things work. Multiple casualties. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to use an analogy to explain this relationship between a field, not actually mechanics, but field of potential. Okay, so here is the big analogy that's going to help you understand this. Electric field is to, what was it to? It was to force. Okay. We said, we're used to thinking of this thing called electrostatic force. But if we say, what is the force per unit charge? We'll call that the field. That way it doesn't depend on the exact charge that's near this other charge. It's just it's creating this thing in space. It's pushing on everything. OK, so here then we have um, the electric potential. That's the new concept. This is the thing I'm trying to give you an intuition for. The electric potential, if this was to force, what is this? This is to, really, it's just add a word. The electric potential energy. 
So we're going to do the exact same thing. All we're going to do, look at it, it's just begging to happen right here. The potential is that test charge times E times delta X. What do you think we're going to do? We're going to say, what's the change in energy per charge? We're going to divide it. That's all we're going to do. Okay? So we're going to say the electric potential, and you have to be careful because you tend to use this word for both the energy and the potential. So I'm usually very careful. When I mean the energy in joules, I say the electric potential energy. But if I mean just the potential, you know, that we would divide it out the charge, then I mean I try not to say energy. Okay? So it is a scalar field. Okay, if we had gone through all the Gauss's law stuff, you would be celebrating that it's a scalar, but we don't care that much here. Um, equal to, to um, the electric potential energy per unit charge. Per unit charge. That's how it's like a field. It's also like a charge normalized thing. So you would think, this is wonderful. I have no problems. I have nothing to worry about. Oh, but you do. The one thing we've got to add to make this annoying and complicated is relative to some point where it's defined to be 0. Defined to be zero, usually, so many qualifiers, far away, but not always. So what does that last part mean? Remember that there's no, for potential energy, there's no natural place where it has to be zero. Well, let's look here. I said the potential was zero when the thing's sitting on the table, but what if it sits on the floor? Why isn't the floor zero? Oh, well, why isn't the bottom of the basement zero? Why isn't the center of the earth zero? Why isn't infinity zero? Right? It could be zero anywhere. Because remember, it's just deltas that matter with potential energy. Uh, springs kind of have a natural place where there'd be zero because springs have a natural place where the interaction goes away. So usually you'd always put zero here where the spring is not compressed. Usually you put zero here where the thing starts or where the floor is. So we're going to have to think about where are we going to put zero here. It's a charge in uniform field. There's actually no magic place. Anywhere it could be zero. Okay, so that's what the second part of that definition means. Relative to some point where it's defined to be zero. So you get to pick where the zero is. So that should make you feel special. Okay, so now let's define it mathematically and give you like the unit and draw it and do all that fun stuff. Let's see. Okay, so here we go. So now we're talking about just the electrostatic potential. The electrostatic potential, not energy. Right? The energy is in joules. This is just the potential. We use V. There you go. There's your volts. Everybody's been excited to see volts. It's just the delta U we've been getting divided by the test charge. It's basically what that paragraph says and what the analogy was all about. All right. So just when you're reading this later, the electric potential energy difference, just a reminder, in case somebody just woke up, then they'll see this and say, oh, yeah, difference for charge Q, and this is charge Q. So the delta U, sometimes you can put a little Q subscript there, but I don't want to make it messy. Okay? And this is the electric potential difference. Or you might hear it called the potential difference. All right, that's delta V. N, and here is your unit. What must the unit be? It must be a joule per coulomb. All right. If you look at the back of your phone or a battery or whatever, is it in joule per coulombs? No. Well, it is because that's the same as a volt, right? One joule per coulomb equals a volt, which is abbreviated V. There you go. So this is what volts are. Okay, volts are just potential energy normalized by the charge. So we can go back and do essentially the same thing we did before: is we have our uniform field 
Whoops. Okay. Uh, this way, like we had before, so this is the E field, E naught, right? It's a constant field pointing uh, to the left, right? And if we have a little positive test charge plus Q and we move it this way, right, through some distance delta X, then we would say the voltage change, the delta V, would be what? We'd come over here and say, oh, it's Q, or the work, I'm sorry, the, the potential energy change is um, QE delta X, like we said before, QE naught delta X over Q. Because we're going to take that energy difference and divide by Q, and we get that it's just E naught delta X. Ah. Right, so that is the voltage change as you move around in a uniform field. E naught delta X. Hmm. Let's see, what does that really mean? Let's see. Let's see. Now we should start visualizing uh, these things, these potentials. Let's see. Um, so let's visualize. V, okay, so I'm going to write it without the delta. So technically, you're always calculating changes in potential, but here, I'm, let me just write potential. Visualize the potential of a uniform field. I can write big or neat. I can't do both. Let's see, of a uniform field. So if we imagine a field kind of looks like this. Now, in the book, you're going to see a lot of field line diagrams where it's one line. And I skipped field lines because we don't really need it. So if you want to use field lines, you can. And we would say, where does the potential change? The, the x is important. Okay, So this means it changes when you move in delta x, assuming the field is in the direction of x. That's sort of an assumption there. If the field's in y, then moving in x doesn't change the potential. So basically, the potential changes when you move along a field. So where is the potential constant? So this line is an equipotential. Let me draw it sideways. There you go, because this is giving away the answer. So where is there an equipotential? There's an equipotential if you move in a way to not change your potential energy. But if you move away, you don't change your potential energy, or then you don't change your potential difference. So to do that, you would need to not move down the field. Right? Remember that F is QE. So F the force that's going to do work is in the direction of the field. So you want to move perpendicular to the field. Right? So that's an equipotential there. That's some voltage. And you could call that zero volts if you wanted to. Like that. And you can say, OK, I'm actually going to let myself glide down the field a little bit. And now I'm at a lower voltage, actually. I've lost my, uh, some potential because the force was this way and I went uh, the opposite. Right? So this uh, would be also an equipotential. Right? This would be like minus 2 volts, say. If I do some work and push myself against the field, I could get to this equipotential, plus 2 volts. So in a uniform field, that's how the potential varies. As you go one way down the field, you lose potential. You go up the field, you gain potential. And the potentials are constant along a line. Now, if you want to think in 3D, they're actually constant on a surface. Because right? remember, these field lines, or these, I'm sorry, these field vectors all point this way everywhere in space. So this line would actually be like a surface. So that's why you'll see them called equipotential surfaces. So the surfaces are planes uh, for a uniform field. Okay. Um, I didn't write all the bullets for that because we don't really need them all. But I have time to, let's see. So let's put a few uh, important bullets here. So, so an arbitrary line is zero volts. So hopefully you see why I just picked one and said it's zero. Just like saying the table is zero, potential, mechanical potential energy or the floor is zero, doesn't matter. Um, um, so let's think about why was one positive and one is the other, or one is negative. When you push against the field, force 
you gain potential, right? You're doing work on the system if you have to push it. Gain uh, delta V. So let's see if that's what we did here. We are at a little positive test charge here. And uh, if you just let it go, it's going to fly that way. But if you push on it, you can do work on it and give it more potential. And that's why this is the plus two line. So here, we pushed it. Here, this one, we just said, wee, and it got a velocity going that way. We didn't push it. We let the system do work on it. Okay, so those are the energy differences. Okay. And they're perpendicular to field lines. Okay. So, and then, so equipotentials are always, another general rule, perpendicular to the field. Here, that's pretty clear because this is a uniform field. But even in the more complicated fields that we'll draw for point charges later, they're always perpendicular. So if I had a point charge field, the equipotentials would be a circle going around it. Because if you were to go around a uh, point charge field, that one board, draw this real fast. There we go. So just to think a little bit about for next time, here's plus Q. The fields come out like this. So how would you have to move to not have any, to do any work? You would have to not move. You'd have to move perpendicular to the field all the time. All right? So there is your equipotential. It's just a sphere around the charge. That would be, say, zero volts. And then mental exercise for you to sleep on at night when you get closer is that plus volts or minus volts. You think about that till Thursday. I'm sure you can figure it out. Sorry. So this is a charge. The arrows are field lines. This is the zero volt equipotential. What equipotential is that? Is it higher volts or less volts? Think about that, and we'll talk about it on Thursday. Uh, yeah, and if he's not, let me know. I can come help. <laughs>